Uh. Hi, Rodney. Nice to meet you. My name is Noelle. Work for Fox in Austin. So, first, talk to me about the emotional roller coaster you've been on. What was your mindset last week, this time? Last week, this time, uh, I was still I had the date over my head, as far as I knew, Wednesday of last week. How? I mean, what does that do to a person to know you were set to die on a certain day? Well, it's pretty much it's pretty much a roller coaster. That's pretty much what it is. I mean, you know, especially being innocent of a case, something like this here, and, and you know, spending all this time and family and all that factors in. But then, you know, I've I've seen guys come, I've seen guys go, and it all it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? It's really it's really kind of hard to explain. I mean, I guess for you to try to really understand being in my position. Yeah, I would have to be in your position. Do you make peace with it? What do you do? Um, do you talk to God? What do you do in your... I, I speak to God. I do a lot of meditating. I, I read, listen to my radio, you know, read magazines, read newspapers, listen to the news on the radio, that type of stuff. I kind of keep my mind, you know, distracted away from this stuff. I try not to entertain death itself, you know. Right. And... It got to the point where you were even filling out paperwork, I saw. That's that's where the entertaining death stepped back in, because I, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about this, filling out the paperwork, you know what I'm saying? It's almost like uh, signing your life off, you know? You know, people who's gonna come and view you, you know, doing your execution, that type of stuff, and your visitors, and it's kind of like, it's, it's not right. I just feel like it's not right. When you were filling that out, what did you think about? I know you have kids. I don't know how many kids. Um, do you have two children? I have three sons. Three sons. What are their ages? Well, Aaron, he's he's 25. He's soon to be 26. Christopher just turned 25. And Anthony is 24. He'll be 25. You a grandpa yet? Yes, I'm a grandfather. How many grandkids? I have four grandkids. Four. Were you thinking about them? What were you thinking about as you were filling out that paperwork? At the moment, I, I wasn't, it was, I wasn't really thinking about them at that time. Right at the moment of filling that out, it's just, it was really like hard to decide who am I, who would want to come view something like this? Who would want to, you know, and then, you know, I've never really spoken with my family about this, you know what I'm saying? And then, all of a sudden, time just crept up on me, and, and here it is. They were requesting for the paper to be filled out. You know, it was the same day I was having a visit, and uh, when my visitor came, it was like it was really kind of uncomfortable trying to relate to them what was just now happening. Because, like I said, I wasn't thinking about. They normally make you turn it in the paperwork 12 days before your execution date, but here it was. It wasn't quite 12 days. You know, I don't know. It's kind of like it snuck up on me. These past 17 years, what has your life been like in this facility? What has my life been like in this facility? Uh, really just trying to maintain and humble myself, you know what I'm saying? Just trying to find a sense of humility, you know what I mean? I mean, because you have, from time to time, there's, there's chaos back here, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's with other inmates or with the officers, you know, you got, there's some type of friction going on. So. You know, you have to just deal with the day on a daily basis. What is your cell like? Are you allowed out? You mentioned a radio. What, what is life like for you Say that in your cell? Describe your daily life. Well, everything is pretty much repetitive. I mean, you wake up and you either get out of your cell for two hours. I mean, if that's a, you know, if you choose to do that, you can go to rec or go take a shower and back to your cell. You know, it's just basically two hours out of the cell. What's it like looking out through the glass when we have freedom? Well, I, I knew what I had, you know, my freedom. And, and, and when you factor in, it's like, like the old saying where you don't, you don't miss it until it's gone, you know, and a lot of people don't miss the simple things, but then I do, you know what I'm saying? The simple things in life is what I miss. You know, and I see, you know, just, just taking a walk, just walking down the sidewalk, you know, it's 
just that simple, you miss that, you know. Being able to see the moon, be able to see the stars, being able to just breathe fresh air. I mean, it's so Monday came Monday. when you got that news. <clears throat> what in the world did you think? A stay of execution. Honestly, I, you know, a guy yelled up at me. He says, "Hey, breathe." He heard it on the he heard it on the radio, and uh, he said, "You got to stay." And I told him, said, well, "Quit playing." You know, I said, quit playing. He said, "No, well, I wouldn't play like that." He said, "Yeah, you got to stay." So then I waited. And then I heard it myself, and I'm like, "Okay." Now, what's the stay about? You know, what are they? What are the courts are going to look? What are they considering? What are they? You know what I'm saying? Because I've seen a lot of stuff where the courts would disregard certain things, but then here it is. My understanding is that they're looking at this new information with this the scientific stuff. I don't really know how or how they're really going to entertain it, but you know, it is what it is. The truth is out there. The the pathologists they know that they, they know what they're looking at. You know. And, it's really how the judge is going to perceive all that themselves and factor it into my, to my innocence. So to know that you have more days that you're not dying on the 5th, what does that do to you? Uh, John told us we'd see you in a different demeanor. I didn't see you last week. How are you different today? Do you feel different? Kind of, sort of, but not really. You know what I'm saying? Because of the fact that I'm still here. The fact that I've been questing for my innocence all this time, you know, and, you know, I'm still here. And so, um, you know, when your defense team has raised so many questions, the newest data involves the timeline of Stites' murder. Why do you think your story of the relationship didn't hold out during trial? You know, all of the, all the stuff pertaining to my whole trial, I, I feel like all this evidence has been out there this whole time. And then when you have the, the Attorney General's Office, the Texas Rangers, and the Bastrop Police and Sheriff Department, these different agencies with unlimited resources, the prosecution, the DA's office, uh, this evidence, all of this evidence actually existed then. It's just that they were the one to find it or be more forthcoming with it, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I feel that this science is in some way it was out there. You know, the fact that my attorneys didn't call a pathologist to rebut anything that the state had to say, you know, it's, it's really telling now at the time, you know, I didn't know because, you know, I was naive of all this stuff, all the ins and outs of the case itself. And so um, you knew Stacy, and I imagine after knowing her, you did a bit of mourning yourself. And what have you thought about all this time, do you think about that the killer's still out there? You know, I know the killer's still out there, or either he's locked up. Uh, in regards to Stacy, I just feel that the, you know, her family, you know, has not been told the truth about this, and they've been, you know, I know that there's members of the family that feel, you know, in the opposite against me, you know what I'm saying? and. Uh, that's not right. They wasn't, they wasn't told the truth. They've been denied justice. And to carry on, I mean, if they understood the evidence, if they understood all the elements in the case, they'd know the truth. I mean, but then you have, when you have this, the AG's office continuously pointing their fingers and, you know, trying to protect their own selves, you know, I don't know, their sense of integrity or whatever, and not being honest, it's, it's just not right for Stacy's family as well. And you've been asked this a dozen times throughout the year, but you've got new audiences along the way, new generations. For instance, I wasn't reporting back in right. 1996, and I wasn't in Austin at the time, but why is it you who did not do the crime? You did not hurt Stacy. Tell me why, you know, it w wouldn't have been you. Excuse me. It wasn't you. It you wasn't me. Absolutely not. I had nothing to do with it. Now, <clears throat> You know, like you mentioned, the new generations, a lot of it, I mean, it's been 18 years, 19 years almost, you know, since her death. Um, it's been about 17 years since I've been locked up, a little over 17. The things that I know now, if I knew then, I wouldn't be locked up. And, but 
the things that I do know now, it kind of bothers me to the point to where, you know, this it's the system. This very same system that has me locked up and on death row is the very same system that's out there watching over our children. You know, when you have kids, young kids that dibble and dabble in, in relations and stuff like that, you know, kids do things, you know. They cheat, they, they party, they hang out, they do a lot of the similar things that we did back then, you know, they're doing them now. You know, and it's just scary that a person can easily be placed on death row just that, just that easy, you know, for the simplest of nothing, you know. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, now with this new audience, what would you say to the public now? Or I guess, what are you looking forward to most that gets out during trial? What's most important that people know about this case and you? About this case? And you. And me. I mean, if you had any opportunity to say anything, I want you to have a platform to tell well, me. I'm innocent. I'm absolutely innocent of this. And I had to live here 17 years. I've got kids now. My, my, my parents are getting older, you know, and I've got grandkids. Yeah, and they're getting older too, getting big. You've seen them? Yes, I saw them. Uh, it was the best Christmas birthday present I had in my life, you know, seeing my grandbabies. You know, my bad son <laughs> got these grandkids, got me, made a grandfather out of me. Yeah. So that's one thing you'll do when, you know, if Absolutely. do you think about getting out and being able to hold them? Hug them, hold them smell the hair while they're still got fresh baby hair. <laughs> that type of stuff, yeah. And so one thing in talking to your attorney, he said he talked to you this morning as well. Yeah. He was going to talk to you. The only thing that concerns him is those other sex assaults you were indicted for that you have maintained your innocence on as well. He said that's the only thing that concerns him. What about you? How do you feel knowing those indictments are still hanging out there? Well. That stuff is not true. I feel that if that would have been true, they would have tried me on that stuff. You know what I'm saying? And the, it's, it's just not true. It's just something that they brought up right before my trial because that, there was nothing in my background that they could use to get me the death penalty. And I think they just brought something up just to bad, bad, I don't know. And even though there was, they said there was DNA evidence, do you believe that? No, I don't. No, I don't. Absolutely, there, there can't be. I mean, I, what I do know is that the, the very person that supposedly had maintained those cases is uh, David Board, and he's no longer on the police force from what I understand, but uh, I don't, I think that there's, needs, that needs to be looked into as well because I don't, I don't believe that. It's not true. So when this happened, when you were arrested for this crime, you know, what was that like? back then? Well, actually I wasn't arrested for this crime. What it happened? was a, it was a, was a, a bogus drug charge, okay? They, they accused me of delivery of cocaine, and which, which turned out to be what they call a pretext of arrest. Well, they, I went up there, they didn't arrest me. I went to the police department and I wanted to know what went on, what, what's going on with this delivery charge. I wasn't delivering no drugs. And, uh, Richard Hernandez, he's, he's all, he was also convicted of some stuff. He was the sheriff at the time. He's no longer in the police force. He'll have a law license. But uh, I went straight to the sheriff. You know, what's going on with this case? And he said, well, yeah, you, you've been charged with delivery of cocaine. I said, is there, you know, is there a bond? And he said, yes, there's a $50,000 bond on I told my mom, I'll see what I can do to see if I'll, I'll see her tomorrow. No, I told her I'd see her later on that day, and she, and I gave my mom a hug, kiss, and he was like, no, you're not going to get out. You're not getting out. You know what I'm saying? you got to get mad straight and all this stuff here, and the judge is not going to be here until tomorrow. Well, I said, well, I told my mom, well, I'll see you tomorrow. Next thing you know, me and, me and the sheriff, Richard Hernandez, we were walking back down the corridors, and, and I, I go to the cell. Well, they put me in the holding cell, and uh, but he had ordered for the officers to get pillow mattresses and blankets. And that's something that's really uncommon for someone to have be comforted that way in a holding cell. And there's like about 15 guys laying on a concrete slab, so I'm 
why are you guys catering to me like this, you know? And then I knock on the glass and I say, say and then you said there was a warrant. Well, let me, let me see my copy of the warrant. He goes, hey, there's just enough time to fabricate a warrant. And I'm looking over it and I'm looking at the dates and times. And this warrant had just been issued the day before. Like, because I, there was a phone call earlier that day where uh, someone had said that they were looking for me the week prior. So which that would have been like the end of the end of March. Okay, so I know that this one is fake. And the next day I thought I was gonna get mad straight, and next thing you know, I'm being taken into the interrogation room. And while sitting there with David Bohr, I asked him, I said, Well, uh, where's the informant or the police officer and the drugs that I was supposed to have dealt? And he's like, Well, we're gonna to get to that later. He flat then he, he he's dealing with his paperwork and then he reaches down in his case, briefcase, and then he flashes me a picture of uh, Stacy. Do you know her? And I'm like, whoa, you know what I'm saying? And it just totally off guard. I'm like, this can't be happening. This is what's going through my mind. I'm like, no, I don't know nothing. I don't know her. I don't know nothing. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to be incriminated or in any kind of way. And uh, that's basically how all this started. Wow. And I mean, when Stacy was, when you found out about her homicide, I mean, what was that like initially when someone who you know well was and see I didn't find out I didn't find out about her death till I don't know three four days later because I had well, I was with her earlier that week you know late night Sunday early morning Monday and I find out about her death it's either Thursday or Friday that week well I hear about it I don't believe it and then there's something on the news I've been told about it and then there's something on the news and it just blew me away you know on the things that she told me you know when she said she told me that Jimmy that Jimmy would kill her if he found out but prior to that he told me that I was gonna pay you know so I don't know and then when you got Jimmy involved with the police you know because he, he was a police officer himself you know who can you say something to, you know what I'm saying, when the police is already pointing his fingers at you from the beginning, the behest of all this stuff. Now that Jimmy's in prison, um, did you ever think that, did you think he did it right away, or now that he's in prison, do you, does it make you wonder more? You know, I wondered then, but now that he's in prison, it pretty much confirms to me that, you know, because, not, not just because he's in prison, the fact that he was a police officer at the time that sworn to protect and serve, I mean, that's partly the reason why a lot of young women are scared, you know, when they get pulled over because they don't know who this cop is or what's gonna happen, you know, and you know, you sworn to protect and serve the community, the people, and then you have an officer doing this type of stuff. I mean, it's not right. It just kind of fits the whole mode of everything that's been going on with this whole case. And what were your feelings for Stacy? Excuse me? What were your feelings for her? What do you mean as far as? Well, when you were, you know, even though she was engaged, there were well, there real feelings there. There were, but at the same time, I was, I was seeing someone too at the time, and we were both cheating. We were both, but we enjoyed our time together, you know what I'm saying? It, that's the way, that's what was going on, that's what was going on at the time. I read somewhere that your mom warned you. She was afraid. Did you ever um, think maybe I shouldn't be doing this? Was there ever something that made you? That never crossed my mind. I mean, I was young. I was being me. I was just having fun. I mean, we were having fun. We just like, you know, we were just doing what we were doing. But then later on, I mean, after I got charged with this and then getting discovery and stuff like this here and I was reading more information, I really, I, it wasn't like I was, it wasn't a selfish way of thinking as far as me, you know, me and her know that we were both cheating on our other, on our partners. But then after reading uh, some of the paper, she was actually seeing more people than, than just me, you know, and that kind of like, wow, that kind of blew me away. And at the time it was made, think, I, made me think, well, could this have been one of them? one of these guys. And then when you had uh, two police officers that were listed as suspects in the case, could it be one of these officers? You know, and one of them 
one of them investigated the case and, and they said that he committed suicide. You know, he was a suspect in the case, investigated on the case, and then next thing you know, there's a suicide. But then my state habeas attorney, he had uh, obtained the uh, the autopsy report on the officer and there was no hand, there was no uh, gunpowder residue on his hands. So that kind of like struck that out of my head, you know what I'm saying, that he didn't commit suicide, he could have committed suicide. You know, because there's no gunpowder residue on his hands. But, uh, what the hell happened? A little later on, when the evidence came about, you know, about the beer cans, and I was still trying to make this connection, you know, how could this guy, where did he come in as a suspect? Because I don't know what the police officers know as far as the investigation was going. And, uh, you know, I wanted my attorneys to test the beer cans because I felt like, you know, they're using DNA to convict me. There's got to be some kind of DNA somewhere that points to someone else. And when my attorneys didn't call my witnesses, uh, I figured, well, you need to get my witnesses in here. Maybe if you test this, this evidence over here while the process of this is going on, it probably take a couple of weeks. This was, this was just my way of thinking at the time. You'll have time to get my witnesses in. I wasn't really banking on any results coming back on those beer cans. I was just hoping that, you know, the judge can stop the trial and you need to, you know, my attorney need to get my witnesses in there. And just so happened, you know, when my attorney, I mean, when the judge, Harold Townsley, he mentioned, he said, well, he didn't want an independent lab to do the test. And I can kind of see him pondering, like, what were we up to or something like, you know, there, there's got to be a reason for them wanting these beer cans to be tested because they felt like it was just trash out there, you know what I'm saying? But I, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if they collect it, bag it, and tag it, it's part of the case. You have an obligation to test it and find out what's on it, you know what I'm saying? And uh, he kind of pondered and thought, well, he didn't want an independent lab to do the testing. He wanted the state to do the testing. And I'm like, well, as long as there's a process going on, that will give my attorneys time enough to get my witnesses together, because he did tell me he was going to call my witnesses. And then the judge, he continued to ponder, and then he said, well, and he wasn't going to stop the trial. And that kind of like blew my plan out of the water because I wanted him to stop the trial so that my attorneys can get my witnesses in the courtroom. And so at that point, I totally forgot about the cans. I totally forgot about the cans. And then, but then the judge granted the motion, so there was a process going. I totally forgot about the process, you know what I'm saying? And it was in 2001. Was it 2001? Sometime, I think it was in 2001. Or late 2000, when uh, the state responded to our state habeas writ, and I was flipping through it, and I, I actually started in the back because I was having a visit that day, and I was looking at, you know, statements. Uh, you know, I, cut, I already knew the state's twisted theory from the beginning. I wanted to go to where people were actually talking, you know, witnesses and stuff like that, and lab reports and stuff. And I ran across that DNA lab report, and I saw bear cans in them. And I thought, yeah, there's the, the cans. And while reading it, they had two of the listed suspects on the beer cans and Stacy's on the beer cans. I'm like, whoa. I got with my attorney. I said, look, you need to file Brady on this. You know what I'm saying? I was just barely starting trying to study a little bit about the law. You know, because the state withheld it. We didn't know nothing about this. And uh, he did. We had an evidentiary hearing, and Lisa Tanner. She said that, uh, at initially, she said that they did give the report over. And then I wrote my attorney, I said, no, ask her specifically, did she give it? Because it's supposed to be from attorneys to attorneys. You know, and then she comes up with this open policy that they had or whatever. But um, when he asked her, no, did you say, let me rephrase this question, did you give it to the defense? And she said, well, I don't recall giving it, but if I, if I didn't, my investigator gave it to them, narrowed it down to two people just her and her investigator, Missy Wolf. Uh, we ended what happened from there. Uh, we ended up calling Mr. Rogers, Will Young, and uh, Karen Blakely, and they basically was validating that, you know, the evidence was Brady, you know, and, and Will Young, he seemed like he was kind of upset because he did, he told, he told the court that he called her first and then faxed the findings over, called Lisa Tanner, and faxed it over to her, knowing that she had an obligation to turn it over to the defense, and but she didn't, she didn't do that. After we took a break, we called, they called uh, Missy Wolf in, and my attorney asked her the same question, did you give it to the defense? Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't recall giving it, if I didn't, she did. 
they basically was pointing the fingers at each other. It was something that critical, you know what I'm saying, with the victim's DNA on it and two listed suspects' DNA on this evidence. Something that critical, you would know whether or not you've given it. I feel, I feel that. So that wasn't brought up initially in trial? Because I've read about it. That wasn't, it wasn't brought up because it wasn't known about. Huh. It wasn't known about until State Davis, until after I saw that, that they had put it off in their red. So I mean, the response to my red. Where were those beer cans? Were they on the side of the road or were they in the truck? From, from what the police officer said, I guess it was out there on the road. And, you know, something that simple, I mean, that's why we're wanting to get all this other stuff DNA tested because, you know, those pieces of evidence, those tangible pieces of evidence need to be tested because they were bagged and tagged with the case and, and it could reveal something like this did. You know, why would that beer can be out there with the victim's DNA on it and, and two of the suspects, listed suspects, they were listed on the suspect list, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't as if we were just going to come match it or see if we compare it to any of the investigators, they were listed as suspects in this case. Wow. And then what, where were you during that time period when she was found? Was or, or when this apparently happened, like on April 23rd at 3 a.m.? At 3 a.m.? Yeah, where were you at that time? I definitely went with her. I was, and I know I was getting ready to go to work because I had work. I had to be at work, I think, maybe 7 in between, I'm going to say between 6.30 and 9, I had to be at work. I was working at uh, the Super S. We were helping re to remodel the store. But at that time, in the morning, I don't know, I was, I couldn't really, just straight out, just tell you exactly where I was at that point. I was probably at my, at my cousin's house or either my mother's house, getting prepared to go to work. Um, sorry to go back, but just so yeah. I can ask you. So your attorney gave me, you know how we were talking about the DNA, you didn't believe it was yours. Did you even know these women who you were indicted for? Well, one was a 12-year-old. No. And then the other, uh, Vivian Harbottle? No, absolutely not. I don't know these people. I never saw these people until that trial. What about the woman who claimed you attacked her in her truck? who testified in the sentencing phase? You talked about, about, you're talking about... Um, you were never charged for that, but she testified in the sentencing phase. Is that Linda, Linda Schluter? Is that Linda Schluter? I, mm. let me see. I don't, I didn't know any of those people except for the mother of my kids. Uh, Carol, Connie, those are the only three people that I knew, but Vivian and the 12 year old you're talking about. No, I, the, so. Who were the names of the people you knew? What were their names? You said Carol? Carol, uh, uh, Connie, Connie, Carol. I was charged and those charges were dropped and dismissed. Right. And Connie, I, I went to trial with Connie's case and uh, with her allegations rather, and uh, I was acquitted. You know, right. That was the time when, I don't know, I was young. I was getting ready to go to the Olympics, well, preparing to go to the Olympic trials. And all that basically shattered, shattered those dreams. For what? For what mean? What was your event? Boxing. Boxing. Wow. Yeah. They actually hung that case over my head for four years before, I, and, and that's something that's really unheard of, especially here in the South in Texas. If someone's accused of something like that, you know, they, you know, they're going to got their evidence, they've got you indicted, they're going to take you to trial. And I was ready to go to trial, and, and uh, that was in 87. They had my trial date set for December of 87. And uh, when the trial date, as it was approaching, two days before the trial date, I get a letter that it's been postponed for two months. That, that scheme went on for four years, every two months, two months, every two months. They would set it off for four years. And then when I finally go to trial, then I'm acquitted. But the Olympics passed. It, I don't know, that kind of messed up my dream. But all these things along the way that you've been accused of, or I mean, do you feel like they were framing or setting up you to be someone for you know, the purpose of convicting you of this crime? 
you know, all it's, these sex assault. It's it's really hard. It's really hard to explain that because, you know, just from my little research, being being here on history in itself, I knew that back in the '60s, a black man couldn't even be married to a white woman, you know, and let alone have a relationship, you know, and. I guess, you know, I grew up a military kid and most of my friends are white, you know, and I, most of my friends, you know, I don't know. I've had intro relation, relationships, my kids are mixed. My grandkids are white as you, blue eyes and everything. Mm -hmm. And that just in Bastrop? Well... Wrong place, would you say? And that's something that, that someone else's morals uh, their values or whatever it is that you know your morals and values are what they are you know what I'm saying let them be your own you know what I'm saying don't make them a part of mine and my the way I grew up I didn't look at race that way I didn't look at people that way everybody's the same to me and I guess if you're not watching who's watching you then I guess they try to attack you in any way they can to attack your character and try to make you out as this monster or whatever Thank you so much for talking to us today. I really appreciate it. Um, anything else you'd like to talk about? This is just as much as yours as it is mine. Like I said, I miss my family, my kids, my grandchildren. Yeah. Thank you so much Thank you. for your time.